Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace and I'm here with my buddy Kyle Tierman. Hey Kyle, welcome back again. Thank you for having me. Kyle is a surfer and a YouTuber, so we figured we'd invite him on because he probably knows a lot more about waves having sat on some of them, I imagine. Hopefully you stand all the way up. Well, but. hopefully. I, you know what? I, I'm not as ambitious in that, in that well, regard. Well, I'll take you surfing. Let's see okay. how you do. Let's, let's do that. I actually would love that. So today we're talking about waves. Yesterday we talked a little bit about waves all over the world and what the different layers of those are. We've talked about the importance of those waves. So make sure you subscribe so you get all of our episodes in this series. This is three of five on waves. But Kyle, what about the best wave? Like, how do I know where a wave is? is gonna be the best. The perfect wave, bro. That's the, what I wanna know, man. The summer I know. that we're I all searching for, man. I haven't even surfed yet, and I still already wanna know the perfect wave. Is that is that ambitious? I feel like it might be. Uh, the perfect wave, I mean, it's, it's tracking swells is a major source of anxiety in my life. Okay. And I've worked very hard to set up a lifestyle for myself where I can track swells and fly out at a moment's notice if there's gonna be really big, good waves on the other side of the world. And a lot of that um, is due to technology. You know, like okay. it, it used to be that you had to wake up and check the surf to see what it was gonna be like. Like Whereas, the surf outside of wherever you surf lived. out of, yeah, outside of wherever you are. But now I can look at any number of websites and pretty, pretty accurately tell how the waves are going to be a week or sometimes even two weeks out. Can you give me an example of like a time where you used like a website or software that's just, these are publicly available forums and, and were able to kind of catch like a great, a great wave, but just by what you know based on putting together all of the things we've talked about in the last uh, bit of our series here. Sure, so I mean, in this, this springtime, I remember I woke up one morning, I was checking my phone. Every morning I go onto my phone and I look at the wave forecast. And then I was like, oh my God, and my girlfriend, I'm like, there's gonna be a really big swell that comes out of Chile in three days. And like, where were you at this time? I was in Santa Cruz, California. Got it. So I was like, I, I need to go down there. Like we need to make this happen. So it's this always this mad rush to try and make it to wherever it happens. So I'm like, okay. I'm going, I'm buying the ticket, bought the ticket that night, Was flew out the next morning, and was down in Chile for this big swell that was gonna hit a spot called Punta Lobos. Um, so I went down, we tracked the swell down there. It was big, beautiful waves. A lot of surfers that, um, that knew about the swell flew down there as well. So sometimes you'll end up on these flights where you're like, there are way too, too many surfers on this flight. Like you, <laughs> you all know what I know. Right. And we went down, we surfed that swell, and I ended up staying, but there were a lot of surfers that tracked that swell all the way up to Mexico. So they were surfing oh. the same swell that they surfed down in Chile up in Mexico two or three days later. Wow, wow. So, so when you do that, you're watching how the waves hit the ocean floor, which we've talked about as the bathymetry of the ocean floor that can determine how high the wave will go and how big the wave is gonna be when it hits the shore. But it's not just looking at the wave's power, right? There's also, you know, like the weather of wherever you're gonna be can take in, is taking into account like whether the wave is gonna be good to surf? Absolutely, because you could have a 60 foot wave, but it's on shore, meaning the wind is blowing at the shore and it's making it really crumbly. South wind, for example, is horrible wind for most places in California because it's blowing up the, the side of the wave, which makes it really junky. It's like trying to ski on moguls as opposed to powder. Sure. So a lot of the best wind for waves is when it's blowing offshore. Okay. Um, that's why Hawaii, the North Shore of Oahu, has really good waves is because its predominant wind is offshore there. So it's blowing a, away so from the shore so out, to, uh, out to sea. It's blowing and away. And it's holding kind of the wave back with the energy of our atmosphere. So when you see um, these photos of guys getting barreled, right, where they're surrounded in water but they're not actually getting touched, mm -hmm. a lot of that is due to offshore winds because it's holding the, the wave up kind of like a sail. Mm -hmm and it is projecting the lip out. So usually wow. offshore conditions or glassy conditions. That means that it's there's very little wind in the water. Um, and and that's that, very then, soft. Yeah, and, like that, and that largely, yeah, I mean, that's another thing because you need to measure the swell, but you also need to look at local storm systems because there could be a completely separate storm system that messes everything up for the big swell that you've been waiting for. So you finally get to Chile and you are ready to surf and then a storm blows in and chops up everything that you were waiting for. 
it, that could happen. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, it's it's all part of the adventure and the search. Wow. Yeah. So when you're looking at that, at all that information, all of this stuff that's pulling together, you're looking for the stuff that we've already talked about, the period and the amplitude you can't really see on on all of these things as clearly as standing in front of the ocean, but you can get some idea. So how, what do you look at? What do you look for? Give us some of your secret sauce on this. Okay, so if I'm in my bed every morning, I'm looking at a few different websites. The first thing that I'll look at is a long range forecast. Um, so I'm looking at where storms are forming and I'm looking at what direction it looks like they're gonna be going, right? Because the direction of the storm, where it's gonna hit the coast, just like a sound wave is gonna determine if you hear me or not, right? If mm -hmm. I'm yelling in the opposite direction, it doesn't matter how big my voice is, it's not gonna right. hit you. We're not gonna see it. So I'm looking at the period and the amplitude. So I'm like, okay, in a week, it looks like it's eight feet at 17 seconds. That's a pretty solid swell. It looks like it's gonna be mellow winds around that time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, go try and be there if you can. <laughs> I mean, it's, it really, I think that people don't fully recognize like the amount of last minute decisions surfers make. Like people that really truly want to dedicate their lives to it. And I think that it's, it is a, a beautiful way to, to live your life. Like, I mean, I'm, I very much live my life around weather as much as possible, um, which is cool. Like, yeah. And I think that a lot of surfers, even though, even if they don't know the scientific terminology of how all of this comes together, they innately understand weather systems. Right, it seems like it, it's kind of like sports stars understand parabolas if they're shooting basketballs and they understand like the subtle physics of wind if they're doing golf, you know, like you can understand all of this stuff and you just kind of instinctually get it. Whereas for me, trying to understand this from a mathematical and a physics perspective with the waves in the ocean, it's becoming quite unwieldy. But when you're just looking at it and you can kind of connect this to what you're experiencing when you're out on the water, it changes your whole perspective. And I'll tell you, it, like when I take you surfing, because we're gonna go, okay. the hardest thing for you isn't gonna be standing up on a wave and balancing. Really? Because I feel like I'm gonna fall over. The hardest thing for you to do is to be able to predict where the wave is gonna come in. Huh. Because actually standing up on a surfboard, it's like it's it takes skill, but it's not as difficult as actually reading the ocean. Mm. So that's what you're going to get a lot better at the more time you spend in the water is reading ocean conditions. Okay, and there are some tools that scientists have for this. So uh, I I looked it up in my analytical scientific -y way, and you can find all sorts of different instruments and tools online. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration puts out all sorts of information constantly. You were talking about the Roaring Forties earlier, and they are constantly lit up red on these online maps that are updated every few minutes for people. And there are buoys that some of the countries around the world have placed into strategic locations in the ocean. And they provide accurate information at very specific locations all over the world, and they're updated by places like NOAA. They're anchored and they can be lost and collided with, and they have to go and replace them and fix them. There's also wave radars, which measure relative wave height, the amplitude of various different waves. There's all sorts of different things. I mean, Doppler, satellites, there's ships out at sea. There's all of these things providing reams of publicly available data that then Kyle can use to go try and stand up on one. That's crazy to me. Also, I want your life. I just want to like go to Chile tomorrow, just because. Just because. Just because I want to go and do something I mean, amazing. The, and just to, to wrap it up, one of the fun, like the most interesting things is that a lot of this science is pretty new. Like coral reef scientists, for example, like they weren't really around before scuba. Mm -hmm. Right, like all these, this new technology that we're creating is helping us understand the world in a really cool way. Yeah, and surfing, one of the nice things I feel like about surfing as a sport is it's understanding nature is a big part of it. And being able to like read and predict nature and you get very much involved with, oh my gosh, we have to protect this coral reef, not just because it gives me like a big mountain to ride, but also because it's important for the ocean's health. Absolutely. I'm a big believer that you can learn most of what you need to learn in the world if you follow something that you're passionate about. Because I was not a science kid when I was a kid. I'm sorry. but No, that's okay. But um, I, I, That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> We're no longer friends. 
But as soon as I got into surfing and wanting to understand swells and try and get a really good wave halfway around the world, I'm like, this is fascinating. I want to mm -hmm. dive deep into this. Yeah, that's another surfer pun which I think is a good place to, to end our series with Kyle here. Thanks for coming in, Kyle, and talking to us about waves. Tomorrow, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how waves have shaped history with like tsunamis and stuff, which if you think about it from surfer language, like a tsunami would be what in surfer language? Like how many, what's its amplitude and period? Uh, tsunamis have a very large period. So it would, you know, you could have a tsunami that has an hour long period. Whoa. Right? So just. But it's only like two feet at like 60 minutes or exactly. something? Exactly. Whoa! And so that can, can't really be created by wind. Yeah. It has to have something like a tectonic plate shift. Or a volcano. Or a volcano or something like a that. Meteor impact. I hope right. not. That's, that's, the not pebble I don't the, that's the pebble in the pond. Yeah, right? for sure. Don't want that. That would be very bad. Well, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus, everyone. Make sure you go find Kyle. Kyle, where can people find you on YouTube? YouTube.com slash. Kyle Tierman. Which we will put a link to down in the description. New so video sure. every single week. That's really, that's really hard. That's really hard <laughs> yeah. to do. And surf at the same time? Where do you sleep? And when? How? Ugh. I'm on that two hour sleep cycle that people are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go to sleep in four, three, two, one. You could watch our sleep series and learn more about that.